awesome, wonderful, and magnificent name of Yeshua, Jesus the Christ. Welcome into the Wednesday night edition of MTV Facebook Live Bible Study. On behalf of the Mount Vernon Missionary Baptist Church, Auburn, Alabama, where I have been privileged and honored to serve as pastor for the past 34 years. It is indeed a pleasure and an honor that I have been given to teach to you tonight the Word of God. Miss Diane Harris Preston, good evening to you and trustees and women, President checking in, Miss Yvonne Whitfield, also good evening to you, Miss Enette Reese and Renee and all of our friends down 29. Trust that all is well with each of you and Dr. Gina Jennings Borkins and Chris and the gang. Good evening to you, Miss Monetta Wilson. Good evening to you also. I pray that you all didn't drink, didn't eat too much yesterday and didn't drink too much yesterday and and you're yet walking today in the favor of God. I am excited about tonight. Um, we talked last night uh, from the gospel as it is recorded by Luke. Tonight, I, uh, hopefully we are simulcasting uh, from the Mount Vernon Baptist Church website and from my personal Facebook page website. And hopefully we are simulcasting um, we are going to lay anchor tonight. Well, I think well, before I tell you where we're going to lay anchor, uh, Sunday, remember immediately, by way of announcements, immediately after the 11, 11 o'clock, Lord have mercy, the 9 o'clock worship service, uh, we will, uh, our women are getting together for brunch, and all females are invited to 10. Uh, Chief Brown, good evening to you, my brother. Uh, turn in your Bibles, if you still uh, use Bibles, or your electronic device to 2 Kings chapter number 6. And I promise you, this won't take long tonight. 2 Kings chapter number 6. And this deals with the prophet Elisha. Remember, he had a mentor by the name of Prophet Elijah, capital E-L-I-J-A-H. And Elijah was prophet for the people of God during some tumultuous, tumultuous times. Ahab and Jezebel were idiots and had taken Israel uh, into a state of apostasy and idol worship, worshiping the idol god Baal and Elisha got, if you read the previous chapters in 1 Kings, Elijah, Elijah, capital E-L-I-J-A-H, had become so disturbed until he started complaining, to I'm all by myself and God said, you idiot, you're not by yourself. I got all kind of folk that hadn't bowed down to Baal. And he took, and God instructed him to take Elisha, capital E-L-I-S-H-A, as his understudy. And you recall that when Elijah got ready to be taken up in a whirlwind, Elisha was there because he had said, I'm not going anywhere because you promised to give me my heart's desire if I see you go, and I'm determined I'm going to see you go. So he saw him go, Elijah left the mantle, and Elisha, Evangelist Teresa Thomas became the head, the HPIC, the head prophet in charge. Remember now that the difference between a prophet and a priest is uh, a priest talks to God for the people, a prophet talks to the people for God. Get that? 
priest talks to God for the people. It's from the Latin word pontiff. Um, a prophet is from the base Hebrew word, a Bible. There are some other words that uh, also signify a prophet. Uh, they were not only seers, but they also were sayers. And so Elisha at the time of this text is the H P I C the head prophet in charge. So as we tip throw to the two list, I'm not going to um, uh, tab a title to the text, but we are going to allow the text to do the talking. Chap verses one through seven, I shall read them and come back and let them let the scriptures do the talking. Remember when the scripture talks, that's called exegesis. When the pastor talks or preacher, whoever is doing the uh, teaching talks, that's called, uh, uh, um, is doing what his opinion, that's called eisegesis. You don't ever want to eisegesis a text. You want to allow the text to exit, exegesis, to, to, to talk for itself. I shall read the first seven verses. I shall read, Lord have mercy. And the sons of the prophets said unto Elisha, Behold now, the place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us. Now, why King James translated that word straight? God only knows. It literally says in the Greek, it's too small. And so I, and I, I need for you all to understand that. Deborah, good evening to you. Uh, it's too small for us. Okay. Uh, let us go, we pray thee unto Jordan, and take thence there every man a being, and let us make us a place there where we may dwell. And he, and he answered, Go ye. And one said, Be content, verse 3, I pray thee, and go with thy servants. And he answered, I will go. Verse four, so he went in with them, he went with them, and when they came to Jordan, they cut down wood. Verse number five, and one was falling a beam, the ax head fell into the water, and he cried and said, alas, master, for it was borrowed. Lord have mercy. Verse six, and the man of God said, where did it fall? And he showed him the place and he cut down a stick and cast it hither and check this out, the iron did swim. And the iron did swim. I'll never keep that question. And the iron did swim. Therefore said he, take it up to thee and put it in his hand, take it up to thee. And he put it out, Lord, I can't read, I can't see. And he put out his hand <laughs> and took it. Okay, um, thus in the reading of the text. What is the text, the scripture saying to us tonight? Basically four things. The text, first of all, is going to tell us that these prophets were full of prosperity. The first point, prosperity. That's in verse one. It's a blues clue. It's what the late Sean Johns would call, Reverend Sean Johns would call a blues clue because, because you would miss prosperity if I, through the Holy Spirit, didn't show it to you. First point is prosperity. That's verse one. Second point that the text is teaching us or telling us is about solidarity. Prosperity, verse one. Solidarity, verse two two, three, and four. Third thing the text teaches us is about adversity, prosperity, verse one, solidarity, two, three, and four, adversity in four, and uh, I'm sorry, in five, and six and seven, it talks to us about authority. So let's look at the text as it teaches us about prosperity, verse one. And the sons of the prophets said unto Elisha, the sons of the prophets uh, simply means in everyday ordinary terms, they, uh, it means students of the prophets. They had 
what we would call a school of the prophets. I'm not sure whether it's a seminary like or undergraduate like, but it was a place where they would learn from Elisha as they had previously learned from Elijah. Okay. And so that uh, this is not the point of the message or this point, but that lets me know that even in the prophetic times of the Old Testament, the prophets, even if they couldn't formally go to school and learn, at least they sat under somebody who they could learn from. Talk to the idiot preacher uh, 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 one day. I, I don't believe in formal education. The Holy Ghost is just going to teach me everything I need. You know, I say, you're an idiot. You can, the Holy Spirit can, but why would the Holy Spirit do something for you that you are capable of doing yourself? They understood, you're right, Covenant, they understood uh, the importance of getting some training so they would say, and, and, and see, one of the things that I've discovered uh, about formal education, because I understand college is, is not for everybody, but one of the things, if not one of the most important things that I have learned from a higher institute of learning is, is that when I talk to people who have not gone to college, they seem to be so narrow minded. And, and one of the things that college does or a higher institute of learning does, it forces you to think out of the box. It, it, it exposes you to different ways of thinking. It exposes you to different ideas, to different concepts. So there are, uh, uh, the, 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 there are people that I, I, I talk to sometimes, so I, and I just have to conclude, okay, they have not yet been taught how to think out of the box, so they're just going to see everything in their little narrow prism. I understand college is not for everybody, but it amazes me how pastoring in the African-American church is one of the few professions, Miss Annie Reese, where you don't have to have any, any training. All you got to do is wake up one day. Um, and as a matter of fact, Miss Annie Reese, you could wake up tomorrow and decide you want to be prophetess um, uh, Annie Reese, and you could put Kaylee on the drums. You can put Mr. Reese on the keyboard, and you can put a nature in the choir and a husband on the deacon board. And now y'all got a church, and y'all could call it the Reese uh, Tabernacle of Faith and you are recognized as a credible leader pastor with no, I mean, wait, actually you probably have more training than they have. What I'm talking about is the prophets felt the need to get some training. Glory, glory to God. Look at verse one and the prosperity. Pastor, I still don't see prosperity in verse one. The sons of a prophet said unto Elisha, Behold now, check out the prosperity. The place where we dwell here is too little, too small, Miss Gracie Talbert, too small, Evangelist Ida, uh, is too small for us. So they had outgrown the school of the prophets. They had outgrown this place. And when you start outgrowing where God has you currently placed, that's called by any definition, prosperity. It's called overflow. It's called progress. Glory to God. It's called a, a, a need to be elevated, uh, a need for elevation, a need for upgrade. So the place where they were dwelled, they had become so prosperous in this school of the prophets, the sons of the prophets had become so numerous until no doubt it became uncomfortable for these large amount of people to stay in this one place. Oh man, oh, my net are already preaching it. God will expand your territory. God will give you prosperity. God, give, God, God will give you progress. But please understand that prosperity cannot be limited to money. God wants to prosper you in every aspect of your life. Because see, there are certain things that money just can't buy. Check this out. Money can buy a heart, but it can't make it beat. Money can buy a eye, but it can't make it see. Money can buy a house, but it can't uh, buy a home. Money can buy sex, but it came by love. 
God wants to prosper you in every aspect of your life. He wants your family to be prosperous. He wants your home to have progress. He wants to elevate your business. He wants to elevate, he wants your uh, relationships. He wants your marriage. He wants your job. God wants you to be prosperous. Matter of fact, the, uh, John, uh, uh, the writer of John said, above all, God would that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. God wants you to be prosperous, but I heard him say in Matthew chapter six, seek ye first, you're not seeking prosperity. See, they tricked y'all, they fooled y'all. As the late uh, Malcolm X was said, they hoodwink y'all, they bum bamboozled y'all by making y'all think the object was to uh, chase prosperity. The object is never to chase prosperity, but let me give you three principles concerning Christian prosperity that you need to know because verse one says that this the, the, the place that they were living and dwelling and learning it had become too small you're right Ms. Annie Reese the first kind of prosperity we need is spiritual prosperity and he will allow well y'all preaching my sermon and he will allow the rest to follow okay um um, um, and let me give you some principles. The first principle of biblical prosperity, if you want to be prosperous, I'm not necessarily talking about money. Yes, we need some money. Yes, we need uh, um, uh, uh, money, but I'm not necessarily talking about money. I'm talking about overall prosperity. Here's the first uh, uh, principle. If you are going to be prosperous, based on Christian principles, the first thing you must have is godliness. Pastor, put me on Bible ground. Psalms 1, David said, blessed is the man. I tell you what, let me go there. Psalm, 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 Psalms 1, slow down. Psalms 1. Listen what David said, blessed, supremely happy, God like joy. Okay. Uh, godliness is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. So number one, you can't take your advice from ungodly folk or ungodly things or ungodly circumstances or ungodly conditions. Where are you taking your advice? You will never be prosperous, he says, if you are if, if you are walking, that's your lifestyle, in the counsel of ungodly folk, nor standing in the way of sinners, nor sitting in the seat of the scorn. You gotta watch your walk, you gotta watch your stance, and you gotta watch where you're sitting. Glory to God. But notice what he says, the key here, but his delight is in the law of the Lord or in the word of God and in the law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the river of water that bring forth fruit of the season. And at least shall not so also with a check out what he said. And whatsoever, somebody underlined whatsoever. And I'm talking to some people tonight, including the um, um, the one that's doing the preaching. We need some whatsoever's to occur in our lives. We need, he said, whatsoever. In other words, everything that you do shall, he didn't say might, he said shall prosper. So if everything we're doing is not prospering, then we need to check our stance, we need to check our sit, and we need to check our counsel. Because he says, whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Pastor, how do you get godliness out of that? Look at that, look at what he just to suppose or compares it with verse 4. The ungodly are not so. So he's saying, if you are godly, these things shall come to pass. What? Whatsoever you do shall prosper. Check this out. As long as what you are doing is according to my will. Everything ever, or as I said last night, as we said back in bed, that everything, everything will prosper. That's number one. You must be godly. Number two, you must have not only godliness, but you must have faithfulness. You can't quit. You can't turn around. You can't throw in the towel. We're still in the prosperity. They said unto him, this place is too small. We have outgrown this place. I'm talking to somebody that you're getting ready, that God is getting ready to bless you uh, with overflow. And you are going to outgrow that business. You're going to outgrow that house. You're going to, out you're going to outgrow your position. And God is getting ready to elevate you. God is getting ready to prosper you. Robert, good evening to you.
God is getting ready to give you an upgrade. Why? Because you have been walking in godliness and you have been walking in faithfulness. Turn to Matthew chapter 25 and verse number 21. Preach Betty Brown's oldest boy. We're still in uh, 2 Kings chapter 6. The first point is prosperity. The, uh, the, the young prophets came to the old uh, prophet and said, we, are, we have outgrown this place. It's time for us to leave here and build a bigger place. Well, I told you, Matthew chapter number 25. I'm teaching this better than some of you all are receiving. Now look at verse number 21. Here's a principle. He said, uh, I don't have time to put it in his context, but his Lord said unto him, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Faithfulness. Why have you, why has he been faithful? Here it is. Thou had been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many, th over many things. God is not going to elevate you in your family, in your business, in your house, in your car, in your relationship. If you are not faithful over the little that he has already given you. Devil, if you won't bless somebody and you're making uh, $500 a week, do you really think God can trust you with $1,000 a week or $2,000 a week or $3,000 a week? Devil, if you're not paying tithe and offering off the $100 that you're getting, he knows you're not going to pay it off $1,000. You're not faithful over a few things. So God is not going to make you rule up over many things. God is getting ready to enlarge some people's territory. And here's what I don't want you to do. I don't want you to get a larger territory and forget about God. Remember the same bridge that brought you may have to carry you back. Glory to God. The same things that you did to get the promotion, you've got to get to continue to get promoted. The same thing. Glory to God. So he says, so he says, yes, there's prosperity at the end of your faithfulness, at the end of your godliness. But the third one, and I, and I don't have time to turn to Joshua chapter one, but you must remain focused. God told you, uh, 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 Joshua, don't you turn to the right. Don't you turn to the left. Keep focused. You meditate. Keep the word of God in your mouth day and night. And David already told you that prosper, that whatsoever you do it, it will prosper and it will grow. And sooner or later, God will enlarge your territory. I'm still on. I, I, I'm, I've just completed the text teaching us that um, about prosperity that that these young men had experienced prosperity. But but not only does the text teach us that they uh, experienced prosperity. I'm trying to find my text. The text also teaches us that they that about solidarity. Solidarity, unity. Look at verse number two, Second Kings chapter six. I'm telling you, the text going to teach us about solidarity. Look at verse two. Let us, that's solidarity. That's unity. Let us do what? Let us go. We coming to you. We pray, we coming, asking that we go in the joy. And take thence every man a beam. In other words, we all going to uh, uh, chop down some wood. And let us, look at the solidarity, make us a place there where we may dwell. And he answered, go ye. Look at the togetherness. Look at the, see, you would be surprised. Now, chances are, and I feel safe in saying this, one of the major reasons they got the prosperity as a team is because they had solidarity. Let me push, pause, rewind, stop, go. The one of the reasons that your organization that your team, that your business, that your family, that your organization is not experiencing the prosperity that these young prophets experience is because you have no solidarity to produce prosperity. Everybody doing what the heck they want to do when they want to do it. And you're like a chicken with his head cut off. Listen to what um, uh, 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 Luke says about a uh, solidarity or against solidarity he says a jesus said this a house divided against itself shall crumble 
your house is crumbling because you have no division. I'm sorry, no solidarity. You have no unity. You will be surprised as what you and your spouse could do if y'all just came together. If y'all weren't beating the air, one going this way, that one going, you would be surprised at what you could accomplish if you and your immediate family, your brothers and your sisters got together for a common cause. You'd be surprised to what your business could do if everybody in your business is on one accord. Solidarity, unified. You'd be surprised at what your ministry could accomplish if you, if everybody was on one accord. Check this out. Solidarity leads to prosperity. I feel safe in saying that solidarity, unity leads to prosperity. First Corinthians 1 and 10. Go there right quickly. As we kind of walk the text tonight, walk, walk the scripture tonight. Now, now we've left prosperity. Now we're talking about solidarity. We're talking about union. I mean, unity. First Corinthians, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, first Corinthians chapter number one, verse 10. Glory to God. My brother, he's Adele Wallace. Good evening to you. Verse 10. It says, now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. Now that doesn't mean that every time you open your mouth, y'all gotta say the same thing. It's talking about concerning Jesus Christ, concerning the faith, concerning how to get the job done. Everybody need to be talking the same thing. Everybody need to be sharing the same vision. Everybody ought to have the same scripture if you're standing on one. That you speak the same thing and there be no divisions among you that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. We all are moving in the same direction. We are all thinking the same thing as it relates to this ministry. Uh, our goal is to glorify God. It, it's, it's, we all are thinking the same thing as it relates to this business. We all want to prosper, but we want to prosper doing it God's way, doing it with ethics and doing it with morals and doing it with a Christian standard. We all are looking for the same thing, working for the same goal, saying the same thing and have the same mindset as it relates to where we are going. The Bible said, the Bible that's according can two or three uh, uh, travel together and uh, um, and not agree. The answer is yes, actually they really can. They can travel together and not agree, but they cannot get to the right destination together unless they agree where they are going. Glory to God. Philippians chapter two and verse two. The apostle said, you want to fulfill my joy? Come together. He said, you want to make me joyous? <laughs> Y'all have solidarity that leads to prosperity. Because division leads to defeat. Everybody got to be on the same page. i never forget um, um, when I matriculated and played for uh, the University of Arkansas. Lou would talk about, Lou, he, he would talk about oneness. We are a team. As a matter of fact, that's why they would make all of us, now they don't do it now, but they made all of us dress alike. Um, um, I mean, we, we all, we all we always had to, when we went on the road, we had to have a tie. We all, we all, we had to look uniform. Why? Because there's a mindset that comes with team and there is no I in team. <laughs> Ecclesiastes 4 and 12 talks about how powerful a three-strand cord is how how powerful unity is when we come together and 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 let me lay this in your lap i've discovered that uh for people to uh really come together somebody no well everybody needs to uh park their ego at the door <laughs> the reason people can't come together is because people bring their egos to the place to the family to the job to the business and somebody has to acquiesce to your narcissistic tendencies or there's going to always be division. Check your ego at the door. If there is a structure, follow the structure, follow the order. <laughs> oh my God, stay in your lane. And guess what? Then we can get the job done. 
solidarity. I told y'all that I wasn't gonna be long. Verse one, the text teaches us that they were that that was prosperity. In verse two, three, and four, look at verse three. And one said, and one said, I pray thee. And one said, be content, I pray thee, and go with thy servant. And he answered, I go. I started to talk about leadership there. Because Bernie, Bernie J. Dale Wallace, uh, he said, they, they asked him, they said, we, we want you to go with us. And he said, cool, I'll go. Good leader is not, is not going to send his folk anywhere where he has not been or, or not willing to go. They said, we want you to go with us. Why? Because you are a leader. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to talk about how leaders have to lead by example, especially when not, on, not only in the secular world, they got leaders. And I mean, in, in the secular world, if you want those under you to be on time, maybe you ought to be on time. <laughs> Glory to God. If you want those who are subordinates to you to uh, maintain a certain or and a certain or maybe you ought to display that. <laughs> Glory to God. If you administer it, don't you tell me to tithe and you tip it. We ought to lead by example. So Elijah, they asked him to go. He said, cool, okay, let's, let's go. Let's go. And I, the late Dr. Edgar Victor Hill said it, uh, said it this way. Edgar, the late Dr. Edgar Victor Hill said that if you call yourself a leader and you look back and nobody following you, you're not leading, you're just taking a walk, boo. And some folk taking a walk and they think they're leading. You lead by example. <laughs> Glory to God. Verse, verse 3. At the end of this, this text is filled with stuff other than the axe head swimming. He said, he said, come go with us. Okay, I'll go. Humility. Leadership. All right. So the text, I gave you all that free. The text is about prosperity. Verse one. Verse four. And he went with them. And when they had come to Jordan, they cut down wood. He, he goes with them. They in solidarity. Everybody doing his or his job, not her, his job. They got axes, they found the tree, it cut the tree down. Okay, so that's the prosperity in one, that's the solidarity in verse two, three, and four. So pastor, what else does the text teach us in the next verse, verse five? Now, there are three things that the church, that verse five teaches us, and uh, you miss them if I didn't show them to you. And now you can see the adversity. Let uh, let let the text teach us, uh, tell us about the adversity. Verse five. But as one, they didn't even call his name. They just telling us one of them. But as one was falling a beam or cutting down the tree, check this out. The axe head fell into the water. That's adversity. He's chopping a tree down. Got the axe down. Probably the axe head is on a piece of wood. And y'all know it get loose if you don't put some wedges in there. Most preachers preach it about how to wedge the axe head so it won't come off. And that's fine because had he secured it, he never would have lost it. <laughs> and some of y'all, oh my God, I ain't been on going there. Some of y'all losing stuff because you didn't secure it. Because you didn't take time to properly take care of it. Oh my God, I'm preaching to myself. I stuck a nail in my foot the other day simply because I was too lazy to do the right preparation. My bridge is out, Evangel Frazier, good evening to you. I have a stream in uh, in the back of my house in some kind of way. My hummer slipped out of gear while we were in Atlanta, ran down the hill, ran into a tree and completely destroyed my bridge. Well, um, um, uh, I'm going to do it yourself. So I went and bought some wood from Lowe's and, and I, I finished tearing the bridge down. Now I've watched uh, contractors work and I know what contractors do. Once they got the bridge torn down with all the wood and the nails, the proper thing to do would have been to take the wood 
and throw it away. But I didn't. I left all the wood and the debris there, and I'm working around. See, I've, I've seen Johnny Hammond and Larry work, and I know how they work. They clean up after they tear up, and then they go and rebuild. But, you know, I got a lazy spirit, and I will admit it. Y'all pray for me. I have a spirit that said, uh, a procrastinating spirit that said, let's do it the short way. Why? Because I need instant gratification. So I need to see the thing going up before I started to, re, uh, uh, to, to clean it up. So I'm, uh, uh, because I did not clean up when I should have, I stepped on a nail and it went in my foot, glory, glory to God. And that's why I had that uh, half shoe on Sunday because now I failed to prepare is the reason I failed. And the reason this fella failed because he did not secure it. And, and, and I hadn't planned on going down this alley tonight, but some of you are losing good stuff because you fail to take care, <laughs> oh my God, of what God has blessed you with. Y'all ain't got to talk to me tonight. Or you fail to properly prepare. And when you fail to properly prepare, you can't blame God for your failure. Let me say it again. If you fail to prepare, you cannot, you cannot blame God, I said God, for your failure. This, this guy wasn't blaming it. He, he didn't blame anybody. I just kind of went all on down that alley. But notice what happened here. Notice the adversity. The adversity was because he didn't properly prepare. Or he was like me. He didn't clean up. He didn't, he, he, uh, you know, he just thought. He, he thought that the axe head was secure enough, but it wasn't. Okay. Verse 5. But as one, thank God they didn't call his name was falling a beam, the ax head fell into the water. Why? Because it wasn't secure. That's adversity. Now, I don't have time tonight to talk to you all about adversity. I think it's John 16, 33. <laughs> now my nephew talking about cleaning. Y'all think y'all preaching clean up with you, man. Well, I, I ultimately, I will clean it up, but actually I still ain't clean it up because I'm not through building the bridge. Okay, even after I cut my foot because I, yeah, okay. All right, all right, check. Check this out. At verse John 16, 33 says in this life, you're going to have some adversity. And please understand me. When you are showing solidarity, heading to prosperity, if it can go wrong, it's going to go wrong. <laughs> please understand me. Everything, not everything, a lot of things are going to go wrong when you are in, engage, engaging solidarity, moving towards your prosperity, things are going to go wrong. And the more wrong you have to go through, the more things that go wrong that you have to go through, the more you will appreciate it when you get it. Cause you can look back and say, Lord, look, I, Lord, you brought me through this, 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 and this. The devil tried to stop what you had promised me and when you get your break out uh, or breakthrough or prosperity or progress or elevation or upgrade, you say, oh, my God, look what I had to go through to get there. Thank God. I made it. And then when people try to criticize you for your prosperity, you don't know what I went through to get here. <laughs> I mean, I mean, see, that's a difference between you being the president of a corporation and you started the corporation and your daddy died and left you in charge. That's a big difference. Or you started in the mail room and worked your way up. That's a big difference. All right. So I talked about the prosperity. I talked about the solidarity. And I told you in verse five that there were three things. But the most but the most significant thing is is the adversity. The axe head fell. But there are two more things that I saw. Oh, my God. And I praise God for this spiritual insight because uh, I can tip throw through the tulips and I can look into the uh, uh, blues clues and bring them to you. Watch this. Watch this. As one was falling to me, I'm letting the text teach. An axe head fell in the water. That's adversity. And he cried and said, alas, master, for it was borrowed. Two things I see in just the phrase, it was borrowed. Please get this. The first thing I see that the text is telling me is not only was there adversity, but there was some generosity. Pastor, you isolated in that text. I don't see any generosity in that. Come, come, come. I'm going to show you. 
somebody was generous enough to loan him, oh my God, an ax head. Somebody was good enough to loan him an ax head. I don't know how valuable it was. I don't know how valuable it was because I can't put a value on your property. And that's a mistake that a whole lot of folk do. Well, it's just an ax head. You don't know what the ax head meant to me. You don't know where I got it from. You don't know how, you don't know it, it, it's just an ax head to you because you borrowed it. It doesn't belong to you, but it may have been my great, 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 great granddad. So stop putting a value on my stuff. <laughs> Preach Betty Brown's oldest boy. Stop putting value on other people's property. And, and now my wife is worried about this. Oh my God. If she loaned you, whatever she loaned you, she, okay, okay. All right. She would tell you, you don't know how valuable it is to me. If it's mine, it's valuable. And most people don't value what they borrow. But this man, all right, so there was somebody who showed him generosity and loaned him the accident. But not only do I see generosity, oh my God, check this out. I told y'all I was gonna let the text do the talking. The text said that somebody had responsibility. Because if it had been some of you all, you all would say it's just, a, it's just an ax head. I mean, what difference does it make? The devil is a liar. This man was responsible enough to want to get the man's ax head back. And please understand me, please understand me, please understand me, Mr. Nitra Lampkin um, 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 Smith, please understand me. You ought to be responsible when you borrow somebody's stuff. And please, 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 like Johnny Taylor would say, please, please, know the difference between lend me and give me. I see integrity here. Matter of fact, I'm going to scratch responsibility and put integrity there. Thank you, Lord. So, the, so we're going to make the, uh, uh, the point after that verse said integrity. Because the man was not content with just losing this brother's ax head. And some of you will borrow and borrow and borrow and borrow and know you have no integrity. You don't, you know, you don't even, you, you have no intentions on paying it back or giving it back or taking care of it. What's the Christian thing to do? It's real simple. If you borrow something, pay, give it back and be responsible and walk in integrity to take care of it while you have it and stop <laughs> putting value on my stuff for me because if you don't if and, and, and i know i sound like i'm going with a tangent but y'all need to understand too many christians are not walking in integrity when it comes to borrowing and lending and then and then when people stop loaning you stuff devil if, if you bring some of that stuff back <laughs> that you borrowed maybe we can loan it to somebody else But we got to the point now, if you borrow it, just keep it. Just don't come back and ask, for, and ask to borrow nothing, nothing. So what did the Bible say about lending and borrowing? Well, the Bible is kind of ambiguous. I don't like to call the Bible ambiguous, the old, in particular when you're moving from the Old to the New Testament. Listen to what David said about people who borrow. He said, people who borrow and don't pay back are wicked. Wicked. When you borrow and don't um, I know that's right, Ms. Reed. When you borrow and don't pay it back, David said, you, you're wicked. You're wicked. What did Jesus say? Interesting. Turn to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 42. See, because I've stopped loaning you folks money, but the most part, I've got to know you real well. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about, I've got to know you real, 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 real well to loan you money now. Now I just give you what I can do without. Okay. 
And there are certain things I just don't, you know, my wife, she don't loan nothing now. No, 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 no. Let them go borrow it. I mean, let them go buy it. We work hard for that. And I, I, I'm not criticizing her. That's a philosophy. There are very few things that my wife will, look, I just, okay, well, go on. Take it, take it, take it, take it, take it. Just, just bring it back. My wife, oh no, we work hard for that. Mm -mm. Why? Uh, what's their problem? That they can't work hard for theirs. <laughs> That's not snobbish. That's just her personality. That's the way she grew up. You don't loan your stuff stuff out. You know, that's not cold hearted. So don't call she and my nether cold hearted. No, 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 mm -mm, no. They just would talk. You don't loan that's your personal stuff. Glory to God. See, now you have to be real close to me. Uh, uh, if it's a tool, you know, because I just borrowed Morris's, um, um, blow up because mine blew up okay but what i'm saying is uh um, um turn to matthew chapter 5 well i tell you matthew 5 4 2 10 you wrote it down to give to him that asked thee and from him that will borrow from thee turn not away so jesus seemed to be suggesting that give that the, but well, okay but see we, we can't take this verse literally because if we take it literally it means whatever they ask for to give them <laughs> and so certainly you don't mean that i have a deacon uh, God bless his soul by the name of Weston Philpott. And when I first made the statement that the Bible does not always mean what it says, it means what it means. He said, oh, Lord, I ain't never heard nothing like that. I said, turn there. He said, give to him that asked thee. So give me your car. He said, well, that ain't what it means. That's my point. It doesn't mean give somebody whatever they have. What it means is to always be in a spirit of giving. Don't, don't, don't shut up your blessings until you are not in a spirit to give. But Jesus seemed to suggest here, matter of fact, in Luke, uh, when he uh, basically said the same thing, uh, Luke 6, 35, he said, but love your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again. So Jesus seemed to suggest that when we loan, we shouldn't look for it back, but I don't think that's the tenor of the context. I think he mean that always be in a spirit of helping. Because if you think that literally means the loan, then I'm going to come up by your house tonight and ask you to loan me uh, $1,000. And so you can't think that that verse means literally, if you're going to loan somebody something, don't expect for them to get it back. Okay. Okay. Now, there's one interesting verse. Uh, how much time I got? Where's my broadcast? I got as much as I need. Uh, we're talking about the integrity of the man who had borrowed the ax and was concerned about getting it back. Look at Romans chapter number 13, verse 13. This is a very interesting question. Now there were some laws concerning borrowing. I don't want to go through all the laws, but Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter number 13. Matthew Marlowe's ax. Romans. Okay, okay. Very interesting. Back in Romans chapter number, where I tell you, 13, uh, verse number 10. Listen what he says here. He says, love, that ain't what I want. Oh my God, I don't want the scripture that says, oh no man, here, here in verse 8. It says, oh no man anything but to love one another. Okay, now, on the surface that appear that he's saying, don't go into debt. It's not, but let's look at the context. Let's go back to verse seven. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom is due, fear to whom fear is due, honor to honor to do. In other words, don't withhold what you owe them as it relates to what he had been talking about. The only real debt you have is to love everybody. Notice what he says. Oh, no man, but to love one another. In context, to render therefore to all their due. Tribute. He's not talking about money there. Uh, well, the, the honorarium could honor could be money, but render unto all that are all their dues. Tribute to whom tribute is due. Custom to whom custom. Fear unto fear. He, he's telling people give people the respect that they deserve. Don't don't withhold it. Don't owe that to them. Oh, give people what they deserve and give people back what you owe them. But you will never pay the debt to love everybody. Now, some interpret that to mean that Christians shouldn't go into debt. 
Hey, you know, who's right? God knows. I don't know who's right. But in the context, it does not seem to mean um, um, because the text is about uh, giving people what they are due, not lending and borrowing money is, is, is what I'm saying. What you got to do is pray about it and talk to your pastor about it. Well, I am most of y'all pastor, but you know, um, um, don't get it. But, 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 but the Bible does speak against getting into a lot of debt where, uh, where you become dishonest, you know, anything, um, um, a, a good way to determine whether something is right or wrong. Oh my God, I heard my sister today and I, and I don't remember who said it, but I, I wish I had. He said, a good way to know whether something is right or wrong to my music, movies, um, uh, uh, going in debt, whatever, is to ask yourself three questions. Does it, does it, uh, it, is it a lust of the flesh? Is it um, pride of life or lust of the eye? If it fits one of those categories, it is wrong. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, pride of life, then it then it shouldn't be doing. It. You know, because somebody said, well, you know, all non-gospel music is sin. Well, that's a lie called um, Mary had a little lamb, not sin, it's not gospel. <laughs> I mean, I mean, so 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 to say that all uh, I'm, I'm all on my subject, but to suggest that all non-praising God music is sin is just not the truth. Did the bitch spy that one up the board of spout? Nursery rhymes aren't glorifying God, but they're not sin. You can determine whether music is sin, whether or not it glorified uh, it, 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 uh, it has to do with lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, or the pride of life. Is, is uh, borrowing money sin? If it had to do with uh, uh, lust of the flesh, I mean, you you borrowing it to satisfy your flesh, knowing that you can't pay it back, love to the eye, you buying something that you know you can't afford, or the proud life, you trying to live above your means, yes, it's sin. Oh my God, that's good. I didn't uh, I didn't coin that. I heard somebody else say that. But I, when I heard it, I said, woo, I like that. Because see, I like principles. Okay, we talked about the prosperity. Now, one of the craziest doctrine that I've ever heard is this crazy doctrine of and I'm just talking to y'all tonight, uh, but before I go to, to the authority, uh, people are talking about supernatural debt cancellation. And, 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 and this foolishness started with the charismatics uh, year, years ago, where they were telling people that God was going to miraculously cancel all of their debt, as if to suggest that it's okay for me to make a bill and expect God to pay it. That's dishonest, y'all. I heard somebody say the other, uh, the other day, uh, we're going to have a meeting and God, and in this meeting, God is going to supernaturally, um, supernaturally eradicate everybody's debt. I said, how dishonest is that? <laughs> okay, so you're going to go to the bank, get a, um, a, a get a loan, and then, okay, God, you pay that loan back. Really? That's silly. That's, 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 that's wicked. That's one of the worst theological doctrines heresy I've ever seen heard in my life that that we're going to teach that all Christians can make bills don't have to pay them and then when they get overwhelmed with the amount of the bill that they they themselves made we can pray to God go to a revival go to a conference and um, God's going to miraculously eliminate our debt and we're going to get letters in the mail that says you no longer owe it. Now, I'm not, your personal testimony is not theological principle. <laughs> because the bank made a mistake and charged somebody else your debt, that does not mean. Now, can God miraculously erase your debt? Yes, but that's not a principle we ought to be teaching people to seek after. We ought to be teaching people how to get financial advice in how to get rid of debt and not how to get back into a whole lot of debt and not to live above our means. Oh my God, how'd that get off in the day? Okay, I was talking about this guy's integrity and borrowing. So we looked at the prosperity in verse one. We looked at the adversity in verse number two. Uh, we looked at the, um, I'm sorry, we looked at solidarity in verse three through four. We looked at the adversity in verse five and finally we look at the authority and it's real simple. Go back to the text. 
the authority of our God. And what's this authority? The authority is that, please write this down, that God has control over everything that he, could, uh, that he created. Oh my God, look at verse seven. And the man of God said, where fell it? And he showed him the place and cut down the, a stick and cast it thither and the iron did swim. God got control over gravity. God has control over the water. God has control over the element. If you don't think he has control over it, talk to the boys who were on board the ship when the storm arose. Jesus took them and said, look, I control that. He said, peace, be still. God has control over everything that he created and he is still in the miracle working business. The ax head began to swim and came and connected itself with the stick. It wasn't Elijah's, it was God doing the miracle. God just used Elijah. Can I help somebody? And you call the supernatural abilities. Can, can I help you? God is looking for people that he can get miracles through. Two and miracles he can get through. I have a saying every morning that I try to remember, and I don't mean to sound narcissistic and arrogant, but I always say, God, there are lots of good people in this world. Just help me to be one. Every day, my prayer to God is, either I say, Lord, there are, there are lots of nice, wonderful, caring people in this world. God, help me to be one. I just want to be one of the nice people. I just want to be one of the caring people. I just want to be one of the giving people. God controls. He has authority. I plan on going into God's authority, but I don't need to. He says all power is in my hand when Jesus got it from the grave. And he has shifted that power to us. You shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come unto you to be witness of men. You did Samaria, the uttermost parts of the world. Glory to God. That's it for tonight, y'all. Prosperity, solidarity, adversity, and authority. That's it. Oh, God bless you, my mother. We got to learn to give. We got to learn how to give because it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. And the songwriter said, the more you give, the more God I give it right back to you. Question is, can I trust you with prosperity? Can I trust you with prosperity? Can I, test, can I trust you to have, to be a part of the solidarity? Can I trust you to hang in there in the midst of adversity? Can I trust you to have charity and be the lender. Can I trust you to walk in integrity that when you are alone to, you walk in integrity? And if I can trust you with all that, then I can trust you with my authority. <laughs> oh my God, look at God. What a mighty God we serve. Lord, tonight we bless your name. We thank you, Lord, for this word, we thank you for every listening ear. Lord, there are millions of good people, nice people, caring people in this world. Just make each of us one. We love you, Lord. We glorify you. We surrender everything we have to you. Now, Lord, I pray for each listener that's listening to the sound of my voice tonight. I pray for a fresh anointing. I pray for a fresh vigor. Lord, so many are down in the dumps with the blues, wondering where you are and why you haven't come. Lord, renew our strength. Give us a new enthusiasm. Give us a new hope. Lord, we will give you the praise. Lord, you brought us out of so many, many. You brought us out so many times before, but Lord, this time is taking longer than the rest. 
Thank you, Lord, for reminding us that if we wait on you, you renew our strength. Thank you, Lord, for renewing our strength tonight. Bless each and every one under the sound of my voice. Lord, while you're blessing them, bless mine and me. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless y'all tonight. Uh, Dr. William May Stokes, good evening to you. Uh, she's one of my, I call her one of my sponsors. She makes my bracelets as well. I always match them up. See, she makes them. Now you can hit her up if you need one, okay? Okay, and if you need your body contoured, hit up her daughter, uh, that's Denitra. She'll contour your body down there in Tuskegee. Whew, that's it, y'all. And uh, Pat uh, Evangelist Frazier is making, matter of fact, I had planned on getting one and, and uh, bringing it to let you see what she does, but I have that next week, okay? Uh, so if you have a business and your business support the ministry, I don't know why my jaw looks well, I think it did. If in fact, I think the shadow, um, if in fact you have a business and your business support MTV, let me know and I will advertise your business. Okay. God bless y'all and may he keep you. Remember after church Sunday, women department will have a meeting. Oh, that's it. God bless y'all until next time. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be unto you all.